mirror here in the man preach on television, and he said it is always God's will for every person to be healed in this life. And he said if you have faith, you will always be healed. I thought about that word always. And I got to thinking that sooner or later we all are going to die. I remember when we were living in Mobile, I was at the Mobile Infirmary and I was walking down the hall. There was a, a dear, precious lady crying her heart out in the hallway. She was a sweet African-American lady. And she was screaming at the top of her voice. And I walked up and I put my arm around her. I said, my sister, can I help you? Can I pray to you? And she shouted out, God took mama. Now this woman looked to me about 85 years of age. She said, God took mama. And, and, and I said to her, I, I knew what she was talking about, but I was trying to find something to say in that very emotional situation. I said, where did God take mama? She said, God took mama home. Why did God take my mama? Why would God do such a thing? Why did God take mama? And I, I, I asked her, I said, how old was mama? She said, mama was 104 years old. I said, did you ever stop to think that maybe God wanted Mama to come home to be with him? Or maybe even Mama was ready to go home? Yes, sometimes it is God's will to bring healing and prevent death in this life. And sometimes it is God's will not to bring healing. Now, would you notice the, the last part of this sentence? Not to bring healing in this life. A third misconception, a third myth. The third myth is God does not heal in this modern day in which we live. Now people who espouse this theology believe in what is called a dispensationalistic theology. Probably many people who embrace this particular doctrine is the idea that at the death of the apostles all spiritual gifts cease to exist especially the guilt of healing. Now, I have a problem with this theology for two reasons. Number one, I have seen people healed and touched by the hand of God in every one of the four ways that I mentioned a moment ago. And my second problem with this theology is God is not limited by time and space and God can do anything He wants to, any time He wants to, and he does not have to ask you. He does not have to ask me. He does not even have to call denominational headquarters in Nashville and get their permission. You see, God is not only omniscient and omnipotent, but he is omnipresent. And he is not restricted by any human ideas we have about him. He and his activity are not confined to a specific time span in history. The Bible teaches he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There, there are many denominations that embrace this theology, this dispensationalistic theology. And so I perceive these to be misconceptions and myths about divine healing. But the main thing that I want to talk about, and I'm going to move very hurriedly to this third point, I want to talk about not the places where we need healing, not the misconceptions people have about healing, but number three, the, the means by which God brings healing. The ways that God imparts His healing grace to His children. Now there are several of them, four or five, and I'm going to walk through them very, very quickly. I believe God heals in this day in at least five ways. If you're going to understand the theology of divine healing, you've got to understand these five means of healing grace that our Lord imparts. Number one, He does it through medicine. He does it through doctors and nurses and therapists and healthcare professionals. And I believe these are God's hands upon this earth in the divine healing process. Now don't misunderstand me. Prayer is important. But just as prayer is important, medicine is also important. Turning your Bibles to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. We have a beautiful healing service here Monday morning, and this selection of scripture was read by Brother Joe Levi. Notice what James, and James is one of the most practical books in the Bible. Somebody has called it religion in shoe leather. It just addresses the everyday problems of life. 
James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Brother James says, Are any among you sick? Let them pray. Let them call for the elders of the church. And let them come and pray over you. Now, notice what it says. Anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now this passage reminds us not only of the importance of prayer, but also of the importance of medicine. Notice that James uses the word oil. Now I believe this particular word definitely has a spiritual connotation as oil, like fire and water, is a type of the Holy Spirit. But it also has a medical meaning as oil was used in the healing process. For example, in Luke chapter 10, you remember when the Good Samaritan found that poor brother by the side of the road? The Bible says that he placed into his wound what? Wine and oil. And this emphasizes the importance of medicine. And I want to say right here how thankful I am for the fine doctors and nurses and health care professionals. Those who are a part of Indian Springs, those who are a part of your home churches, those who are a part of the church I serve. And so, number one, God heals through medicine. All right, number two, God heals through grace. Grace makes us strong. Now, this grace may not cure us, but it does heal us. And there is a distinctive difference between the two. For example, probably the prime example in the Bible of this second point. Paul had some type of illness or sickness. We're not real sure of what it was. Paul called it a thorn in the flesh. I, I'm not sure that's a good translation. Actually, it was more than a thorn. It's the Greek word skolops, sigma, kappa, omicron, lambda, omicron, pi, sigma, skolops. And Bible commentaries tell us that literally it can mean a huge stake. And we're not real sure of what that or that state was. And it's interesting that various figures in church history, all the way from Augustine to Martin Luther, have surmised as to what that form was. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, notice three times Paul prayed for God to remove the thorn. Notice how God answered his prayer. Three times God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. God told Paul, I'm not going to remove your thorn, but I am going to give you the grace to bear it. And in giving you this grace, it's going to make you strong. And just think of the vast contribution that Paul, in the strength of this healing grace, made to the church. He systematized much of what we know today as New Testament theology. He wrote several books of the Bible. He made Christianity a missionary faith. So number two, God heals not only through medicine, but through grace. All right, number three, God heals gradually. That's been my experience that usually this is the kind of healing that takes place whenever there is emotional pain. If somebody has been deeply hurt emotionally by another person, it's difficult for healing to take place overnight. Oh, with God's grace, it definitely can. I'm just telling you from my experience after over 30 years in the ministry that usually it takes time. And that emotional healing, it comes. But it comes gradually. I remember hearing a minister say once, the two greatest agents of God's healing are number one, God's grace, and number two, God's but there's a fourth way that God heals. Sometimes God heals instantly. Now, this is the type of healing that is most requested by people. And it seems to be the type of healing that is least granted by God. And I think one of the reasons God does not heal instantly any more than He does is because this particular act has the potential to diminish his nature rather than magnify it. If you study the New Testament, you will find that many times after Jesus performed instantaneous miracles, he would urge the people to tell no one. Now many years have passed since the days of Jesus, and the family of man is different. 